Hey everyone, welcome to the Democrat series. Uh, you guys seem to really be liking this, so I'll just keep doing it. So first thing I should mention is that we are going down in popularity in the polls. After doing Joe Biden first and Bernie Sanders second, we've now kind of moved into people who are uh, at 10% or less of popular support, or at least uh, that's a common conception. We've covered pretty much over half of people's preferred candidates. So uh, welcome. I'll come back to this when we start getting to when things start really getting weird. But uh, Elizabeth Warren and Kamala Harris, which are going to be the next two episodes, uh, they represent potential candidates. These are candidates that have a following. It's not as big as Sanders or as uh, Joe Biden, but there's a possibility that, you know, if the polls go better, if the debates happen, the thing is, is that a lot of the ways the Democratic Party are working right now is that popularity is based almost entirely on name recognition because there hasn't been a debate yet. Once the debates start and we start having, you know, the real race, which starts next month, then you'll start seeing people drop out. You'll start seeing people climb that you didn't expect and we'll start to really get an idea of what the shape of this horse race is. That being said, let's talk about the number three most popular candidate, Elizabeth Warren. So let's start by talking a little bit about where Elizabeth Warren comes from. She was born in 1949 in Oklahoma City, and according to her own description of her biography, her family basically was always at the brink of bankruptcy. She worked in an extremely working class family that was struggling to get by. Another thing that uh, definitely had an impact on Elizabeth Warren's political positions, or must have anyway, was that when she was 12, her father had a heart attack and the family struggled pretty hard to be able to pay for his medical treatments. It resulted in him having to uh, cut back a lot on his work and the family suffered quite a bit for it. Uh, Elizabeth Warren as a politician is actually not that deep of a history. Uh, she only became a senator in the 2012 election. So it's only been about seven years, which compared to like Bernie Sanders who has been doing politics since the depending upon how you define politics, the 60s, uh, or Joe Biden, who's been in politics since the 70s, Elizabeth Warren comes to the presidential race kind of from another angle. And the first thing that I should mention is that she was a professor. She has a PhD in law and was a highly regarded professor for quite a long time before she entered politics. And another thing that we have to mention about Elizabeth Warren is that she has definitely gone through a political transition over her career. She's considered now to be a firebrand of the progressive movement in American politics, but she started off as actually a fairly right-wing neoliberal. So let's start with that. Earlier on in her career, she was involved in something called the Law and Economics Movement, which was an idea to take the growing popular uh, neoliberal economic model and applying it to new areas of the way we govern ourselves, her favorite being law. So this is like in the 1980s and a lot of her research in the early 80s had to do with studying how public utilities work through the lens of neoliberal economics. She was an advocate for deregulating public utilities and uh, basically arguing that the government should have as little to do with the management of public utilities as possible. Also in a very un-Elizabeth Warren type move, she was for automatic utility rate increases, which would make people's bills go up year on year because that would be quote unquote, more efficient. But her career really took off when she became an advocate for factual, on the ground, uh, like evidence-based study of how people and the law interact. Uh, very quickly, she actually became a rising star in the field of bankruptcy law, which would eventually basically define the trajectory of her career. Uh, she found in a study of people who were in bankruptcy, like what was causing bankruptcy and found that contrary to the popular idea that people went into bankruptcy because they were spending more than they could save, 
uh, the more common cause of bankruptcy was that they were taking out loans that they could not afford in order to buy houses in good school districts. Her career as a bankruptcy professor increased when she was part of a commission document that opposed a law that was being thought about that would make it even harder for people to file for bankruptcy. A law that 10 years later in 2005 would become canon and now it's much harder to file for bankruptcy. And this would continue throughout her professorial career, so you're gonna hear the word bankruptcy a lot. She was part of the Bankruptcy Conference, which was an organization that was designed for informing Congress about issues relating to bankruptcy. And because of this lifetime of working on uh, bankruptcy laws and trying to make things better for people to manage uh, the huge amounts of debt that people are going into to pretend that the middle class still exists, she was actually put in the Consumer Protection Bureau when it was founded in 2011, which is sort of a response to the Dodd-Frank Act and everything like that. Hey look, there's a cat now. In 2008, Harry Reid actually gave her a job as part of a congressional oversight committee that had to do with consumer financial protection. <laughs> Specifically, she was put in charge of implementing oversight on the uh, emergency money, you know, the, the emergency funds that were signed shortly into the Obama administration in order to stabilize the Great Depression. The Great Recession, sorry. You'll notice that Elizabeth Warren's, uh, you'll notice that Elizabeth Warren's political career is tied extremely close to the Great Recession, which in my mind is a great idea because the Great Recession should have been a political awakening for more people, but, you know, you'll take what you can get. During her tenure in this oversight committee, she pushed for a whole lot of policy projects. Not all of them got implemented because Obama wasn't exactly that progressive a president, but uh, let's just go through some of them. So she wanted to mitigate foreclosures and make sure that they were not as easy to do as they was going on in the early Obama administration. She wrote about consumer and small business lending, uh, real estate for commercial purposes, bank stress relief, and also uh, the study about whether or not TARP was working, which was the name of the lots of lots of money that was put out to banks in order to make sure that they didn't go down and take the entire economy with them. And she was also put on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because she was one of its chief advocates, one of the people really pushing for it to exist. So uh, it's sort of her baby. She was put in it in 2011, it was signed into ACT in 2010, so it all worked. And this is really like the period in which Elizabeth Warren started to become a name on the scene, or should I say a name for those who are, uh, you know, really down with American politics. Uh, a lot of the people who knew her in high school knew her as this extremely like right-wing person. So a lot of people point out that even in her early academic career, she has gone through a major political uh, metamorphosis that makes her almost unrecognizable to her previous self. Like in the 80s, she was considered a laissez-faire, like neoclassical conservative. Another thing we have to talk about is that Elizabeth Warren was told from a young age that she had uh, Native American ancestry, specifically Cherokee, I believe. Now, everyone that has hired her has claimed that it had no part in her getting hired. She's never like identified as Native American on a college application or anything like that. Uh, but that was the case that the right tried to make against her uh, to say that she didn't earn any of the academic positions that she got, that she was just a diversity hire and all the blah, 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 blah. You can watch why people would make this argument in the conservative description video that Innuendo Studios did. Uh, link in the down there part. Uh, pretty good, actually, to explain how conservatives articulate the world in different ways than liberals do. And uh, I think it's pretty accurate. Anyways, one of her frequent uh, jobs is as professional Twitter troll for Donald Trump. And one of the things that Donald Trump did was offer to pay a million dollars to a charity of her choice if she were to take a DNA test to prove that she was actually Native American. A thing that then she somehow decided to do. If you remember when she did this in 2018, it was met with uh, universal disdain and pretty much everyone pointing out that this was at best, her capitulating to a bully, and at worst, just a complete tone-deaf reading about what indigeneity actually means. The actual DNA test uh, resulted in her being almost exclusively of European ancestry with maybe one Native American ancestor roughly six to ten generations ago. 
so virtually nothing. The Cherokee Nation called this inappropriate and wrong, but she has sort of come back on this narrative quite a bit. She has pointed out that there is a large difference between Native American ancestry and tribal membership, and she has personally apologized to the Cherokee Nation for the claims she made in the past. A uh, bit of a gaffe, and definitely a sign of what would be a racial insensitivity in my mind, but uh, this is a thing that happens a lot in Americans, especially amongst white Americans. The, the claim of having one Native American ancestor is uh, quite uh, common in white American family lore, and I mean, ignorance of how indigenous people identify themselves and how tribal you know, membership works uh, is not uncommon. All I can say to it is it was definitely a problematic part of her personality, which, uh, if you think of in the long span of her career, she's had a lot of problematic positions and personalities that she has since turned around on. So, at the very least, she, uh, apologizes well, and at least seems to be changing in a good direction. She's also done stuff like surprise visits to Native American conferences, and she got the thumbs up from Deb Holland, who is one of the two first Native American women ever elected to US Congress, uh, both of which happened in 2018. Oh man, America, that's, eh, that is poor form even for you. To sort of expand on her conservative past, uh, for the majority of the 90s, she was an identified Republican, of which she claimed that she supported because she quote-unquote supported markets. Uh, and she thought that the Republicans were the ones who were the most for markets. Again, I think this just comes from uh, spending too much time in academia and having way too much faith in how capitalism works. Which we'll bring up again because uh, I've got my issues with Elizabeth Warren vis-a-vis -vis her support of capitalism. Uh, according to her, in 1995, she switched from being a Republican to a Democrat specifically because she decided that the Democrats were the ones who best supported markets. She really likes markets. She basically says now that her issue with the Republican Party is that they no longer are believers in the free market, and now the Republican Party simply uses state institutions to gut the middle class. So sometimes in the more uh, leftist spaces of the internet, uh, this criticism of Elizabeth Warren of having this conservative history, having this um, Republican past, gets brought up a lot. And while you should not forget that, and she has never actually repented about her support for capitalism and markets, she has come around on a lot of these issues, and to not support people coming out of the politics to become better is poor form. Trust me, Elizabeth Warren is not the only person who held political opinions that they later regret. I imagine you have a few yourself. I certainly do. So in 2012, Elizabeth Warren decided to run for Senator of Massachusetts. She wanted to challenge the seat of Scott Brown, who uh, I realize now many of you are younger. You might remember that uh, Scott Brown was the Republican who won the senatorship of Massachusetts, which everyone thought would be impossible. During the Tea Party wave, which occurred uh, shortly after the death of Ted Kennedy, who had been the senator of Massachusetts for eons, Scott Brown became a Republican senator of Massachusetts, which uh, was super weird. Uh, so Elizabeth Warren challenged him in 2012 and won. Part of her 2012 campaign that stuck out as prominent is that she had a viral video ad that uh, basically was response to the right's criticism saying that uh, asking the rich to pay more for taxes was somehow class warfare. She responded by saying that nobody in America gets that rich without uh, benefiting from all of the things that these extra taxes would have paid for anyway. So uh, put up or shut up. And she even got some blowback from her fellow Democrats. A lot of those financial institutions that were benefiting from all of the debt that they were trying to clamp down on getting people to the point where they could declare bankruptcy easier. Uh, yeah, they really didn't like her. And so there was a push from the financial class, which are basically the people who run the Democratic Party, did a lot of pressure on the Democrats in order to make sure that she could not win. But 
She came through anyway, in a rare act of democracy. And she was just so popular that she actually got a prime time speaking spot at the 2012 Democratic National Convention, which is pretty cool. That's usually a sign that you're gonna be moving up in politics very soon. She sort of positioned herself as like the champion for the beleaguered middle class, that she was going to be the fighter for the average Joe to defeat the forces of unregulated financial capital. And as Senator Elizabeth Warren did a lot of what Elizabeth Warren does, it's sort of the thing she's known for. She was the bullish attack person at the Senate, pointing out all those financial institutions and how much they were screwing people over, uh, getting caught on there with a zippy liner and it turning into a viral video. That's sort of the Elizabeth Warren program. That's the thing she's best at. And I think that's a very good thing to do. Trying to draw attention to financial regulation is a tough and uphill battle. The fact that she can uh, frame it in human terms and in a way and on a platform that results in something like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau getting more attention is a laudable cause. She was even a big advocate for trying to reform student loans, even proposing a program that would let students more easily borrow money from the federal government at a low interest rate. And uh, Bernie Sanders, the subject of uh, the last video, said that the only issue he had with this bill is that he wasn't the one who proposed it. In 2015, she joined several other senators to try and propose a new Glass-Steagall Act, which would bring back Glass-Steagall era protections that separate uh, financial institutions that take care of personal assets, people's actual money, and investment banks that make money through gambling on the stock market. So again, for those who didn't see the Bernie Sanders video, this was a New Deal era law put in place by FDR that was designed to prevent another Great Depression happening because a lot of the cause of the Great Depression were that banks were gambling on the stock market with their customers' money, and then when the stock market collapsed, a lot of people's personal finances disappeared. In 1998, the Democratic government of Bill Clinton repealed that law, and it is one of the number one things blamed for the Great Crash in 2007 and 2008, which put us in the mess we're in now. So reinstating Glass-Steagall is a very logical and easy thing to do that would at least make the ups and downs, the great booms and crashes, that is the defining trait of capitalism, uh, at least have a little bit more of a smooth curve. If you think about it, it kept a major economic collapse from happening for several decades until it was taken down. So we got this strong picture of what Elizabeth Warren's first term as senator has been like. She is a bullish senator who calls out bankers for basically using their powerful assets to push politics in a bad direction, but also to screw over middle class people. She's not very confrontational with her own party, but is very easily able to go hog wild on Republicans. And her inability to really fight in intra-party fights is one of the things that I have serious reservations about with Elizabeth Warren. Uh, for example, in the 2016 election, she had a kind of mixed uh, result in what she did during the Democratic primaries. Honestly, she was so famous that she was floated as a candidate in the 2016 election, but she didn't run. And I think that comes down to a number of factors, like the fact that she's rumored to not actually like campaigning all that much, but uh, I think it more has to do with the fact that the Clinton power brokers did a lot to shut down anybody from thinking of running for president uh, and, you know, resisting Hillary Clinton, her turn at the White House. However, through the entire 2016 process, she was floated as a possible running mate and even as a possible candidate. That being said, before Bernie announced his candidacy, she was part of a letter that was signed in 2013 urging Hillary Clinton to run for president in 2016. And once Bernie had officially dropped out of the race, like almost instantly after Bernie had dropped out of the race, 
uh, she endorsed Hillary Clinton for the presidency. During the hottest part of the Democratic primaries, a time when the Sanders campaign was just, you know, teetering about whether or not it was going to be able to make a big dent, a dent big enough to possibly even turn this heavily stacked against him primary around, Elizabeth Warren was nowhere to be seen. She didn't do anything. She stayed completely out of uh, the Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton uh, debates. And that is, I think, a real sore spot. She and Sanders have been buddies in the Senate for quite a while. They worked on a lot of things together. They have a lot of similar ideas. And she just didn't do it because I imagine that there was a lot of pressure from the Clintons, from the Democratic Party, that Sanders could not be the candidate. He was not allowed to be the candidate. We already decided who that was going to be. And this guy is messing with the whole process. So anybody who supports Sanders is going to get screwed. And I imagine that Elizabeth Warren, who seems rather conflict averse within the Democratic Party, didn't say anything. She kind of silently said that it's good that Sanders is running, but would never come out and endorse him which uh, would have been an extremely important key endorsement that might, I mean, I can't say that it would be the only thing that would have kept, but it might have helped Sanders um, get into a stronger position and possibly even be president right now. Hmm. However, she returned to form during the 2016 election and she became very, very good at anti-Trump clapback. Her tweets and televised comments about Donald Trump are savage and on point. As I said, it's the thing she's really good at doing. And then in February of this year, she announced that she is running for president in 2020 under the Democratic ticket in this huge primary field that we're dealing with. And I do have to say bonus points because she announced her candidacy at the spot of the 1912 Bread and Roses strike, which I think is awesome. All right. So that's her political history. What? are her positions as a 2020 Democratic candidate. And I already can see that this is gonna be just as long as a Sanders video, if not longer. So let's take one thing, which is her anti-corruption stuff. She's very uh, aware and wants to combat the influence of lobbyists in the American political process. A few of the things that she wants to do to change that would include uh, controls on lobbyists being able to fund money into American political candidates, a lifetime ban on the quote unquote revolving door, which is a serious issue about influence brokers in American politics where uh, it's called the revolving door. Politicians might do favors for a certain industry with the promise that after they leave politics, they'll walk into a very high paying cushy job as either a lobbyist or uh, in that company after they leave. So she would want to call for a permanent ban on politicians going into lobbying after they finish their terms. She would also want to put a ban on politicians being able to trade stocks while they are in office, which seems legit. You don't want to have your politicians having financial stakes in certain industries being profitable uh, because that is more than likely to influence the way that they vote on important things when, say, a horrible company needs to be regulated in a way that will probably result in them having lower profits. On economics, she is uh, good and bad in different ways. One of the things is that she has explicitly said that she rejects the title of socialism. She doesn't like socialism. She has described herself as, quote unquote, a capitalist to my bones, which, uh, that's enough for me to be like, mm. like, she lost like a lot of points for this just clinging to an economic system that has demonstrated over and over again to be destructive and bad. That being said, she has a whole slew of social programs she wants to make sure are funded based on what is called an ultra millionaire tax, which would be a drastic increase of taxes for the most wealthy, which, you know, I'm down for. This tax would get an estimated $250 billion in annual revenue, which she could use to fund pre-K, universal childcare, forgiveness for student loan debts, a Green New Deal and an overhauled medical system. All are good things. She even wants to do a major investment in low cost housing to help the people who can't afford to buy homes. She's also put in some stuff that really situates her as the 
uh, person trying to defend the middle class, uh, corporations, for example, that are over a certain size in assets, she would require to have at least 40% of the board be elected from amongst the employees of said company. The idea would be is that the people who work in said company would have stake in the company and that it would stem the flow of wealth moving from the bottom to the top and maybe push some back in the other direction. Again, this is like stuff that shows that she has faith in the system, just that the system needs tiny tweaks to make it work for people where, you know, the fact that the board of directors would just find ways to get around the game. Uh, that part doesn't factor. She's for the Green New Deal. That would be paid for with her ultra millionaire tax. Good stuff. But she did say that she is against the US government taking over certain industries. She's anti-nationalizing things, which as I've said multiple times on this channel in the past and streams and such, that really one of the most important things to do to fix some of the major problems in the way our economy works is to take aspects of it outside of what's called commoditization or outside of market forces because the market can't be trusted to run them. I would argue that everything should be taken out of market and marketization and commodification, but at least the things that we need to live, like food and shelter and things like that, should definitely not be subject to market forces. We learn this with farmers, that's why farmers get so many subsidies, but we haven't learned that for homes and... Sorry, things are disconcerting. The camera literally died on me mid-rant. Um, there are lots of other things that would not fit in a marketized or commoditized system, like healthcare, food, things like that. I think I already covered some of this, so let's just move on. She also has like kind of fitting in this like faith in capitalism, uh, this idea that if we just had stronger antitrust laws and broke up uh, specifically in her mind, the tech sector, we would get rid of monopolies, which are what is causing all of our ruckus. And yeah, this whole capitalism thing, just uh, real stick in my craw, that's why I keep bringing it up. On the subject of electoral reform, she is definitely down for using the popular vote to choose the president instead of the Electoral College. She is anti-Citizens United versus FEC, which means that she wants to basically get rid of super PACs altogether, but basically limit the idea of political action committees being able to donate unlimited amounts of money from corporations or really whatever group they want into politicians' um, campaigns. And of course, a ban on gerrymandering. It's a pretty good set of policies to make America more democratic. It's not nearly as far as Bernie Sanders' plans, but it's still pretty good. It goes nearly as far as Bernie Sanders' plan, but still pretty good is should be just like the slogan of the Elizabeth Warren campaign. Moving on to foreign policy, another part where she doesn't shine all that great. Uh, she is against the renegotiation of NAFTA that Trump has put forward, unless it can be used to make the lives of the American worker better. That's a decent enough take, but she also is pro having a strong military. Has said that America needs a strong military. She recently voted for the massive military spending increase that Donald Trump tried to put forward. Sorry, Donald Trump did put forward, we live in hell world. She said she wants to bring a lot of the troops home and give them the care they deserve, which I imagine means, you know, fully funding the VA and having it actually do things. And she does support, quote, cutting the bloated defense budget, despite very recently voting to increase the defense budget. This part confuses me. But I do like her no endless wars policy. That sounds nice. No discussion about trying to make uh, more congressional approval about military conflicts, but you can't have everything, I guess. She came out in this kind of bewildering support of Ilhan Omar and took sort of a both sides-ism to the issue. It was really kind of just like, but a lot of the Democrats didn't really do anything all that awesome for Ilhan Omar, so. And it was probably one of the better responses because at least uh, Elizabeth Warren didn't go to AIPAC and openly attack her which some Democrats did. Chuck Schumer. She also wants to put a block on like foreign companies buying like massive amounts of like assets in America. Like no foreign corporation should be able to buy American farmland, which I put under foreign policy because I guess it's a foreign policy. I don't know, I'm not much of a farmland expert, so I don't really know what the 
implications of this are, but uh, massive corporations buying out farms in general probably sounds bad to me. I do like the idea that the people who attack communism are always like, oh, remember how horrible it was when they collectivized all the farms? Like pushing all those people out of their farms that they had lived on for hundreds of years. How bad, Soviets, so bad. And then like they do the exact same thing. It's just that like a giant factory farm just buys them all. Moving on to housing, she supports using government resources to build millions of new homes for Americans, which I guess is a good idea. Uh, it just makes me wonder, cause like there's more empty homes than homeless people right now. Like, why are we building more homes instead of putting people in the homes that already exist? This is one of the horrible side effects that come with the fact that housing as part of a market, as part of a commodity, ends up becoming an asset rather than a thing people need to live in. And so you end up with people who own homes because they can just resell them at a higher value and then no one lives in them. So this is a way to sort of alleviate the problem by increasing the supply so that it is it makes the price go down. But uh, that's just a Band-Aid on the systemic issue beneath it. And again, wants to reward communities for relaxing zoning standards and things like that to allow for more low income housing to be built to prevent you know, the resegregation of America and redlining and all that kind of stuff. And she even specifically said she wants to use her ultra millionaire tax to lower rent without a specific plan for how to do that. But still, I like the idea. Now let's move on to medicine and healthcare, which uh, again, a little mercurial. Uh, Elizabeth Warren has spoken out that the United States should provide through Medicare, healthcare for every American, health coverage for every American. This flies in the face in a more recent thing that she has said, where now her definition of quote unquote Medicare for all, which is basically the def I just defined, uh, now means universal coverage. And that uh, it does not necessarily mean a public health care system, that it just means that there is, you know, affordable health care with universal coverage for everyone, which to me sounds like the thesis statement of Obamacare, a notoriously failed program. When it comes to things like drug costs, she wants the government to start actually producing its own generic brands of medications in order to drive the price down. It's sort of like a public option of medicine. And she also wants to increase the US's resources for dealing with drug addiction, judging how like opioids are killing Americans like flies, that makes a lot of sense. On the criminal justice angle, she wants to uh, push for uh, getting rid of racial bias within the justice system. And on top of that, she also wants the decriminalization of weed, which, you know, would solve a lot of problems. As I said in previous videos, it would be not only an economic boom, but on top of that, it would put a lot of people who haven't done anything wrong uh, and keep them from being put in prison for basically no reason. She wants to use more community policing and wants to make sure that the police are demilitarized, which, you know, are all things I can get behind. The major part of her criminal justice reform is that she wants the white collar crime, the crime of embezzlement and uh, large financial things. She wants that to be beefier. She wants the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to have more teeth and for more CEOs to go to prison, which like, I am totally here for. So as I did with Bernie Sanders, I'm now gonna take a step back and look at her candidacy in the whole and think about what sort of considerations we should have before throwing our full support behind her and what kind of reservations we should have and things we should at least consider. The first thing, and I brought this up a couple times, which is her troubling relationship of party versus country. There is a lot of signs, like I said, with the rumors that she doesn't like campaigning, but also with her not really wanting to rock the boat from within the party, showing that she's probably pretty conflict averse, which um, when you're president can be a problem, but also when she wants to propose some sort of super progressive program and the party says, nah, what will she do there? She doesn't really have a record of going to war with the Democrats. If you want to push a progressive agenda, 
the Democrats are going to be your biggest opposition. The Republicans are a write-off. We already know you can't deal with them. There's no, there's no Obama-era attempts at trying to make a bipartisan fix to these things. But even within the Democrats, you're going to have issues because the Democrats are majority a conservative right-wing party. And if you're not willing to go in the bully pulpit and get the people to actively like aggregate against the Democrats, you're not going to do super well. And as someone who is in the Democratic Party and as someone who has in a few times that I would think that her interests were at odds with the Democrats, she defaulted to what the Democrats wanted. And that uh, would be a problem. That is a in my opinion, that is a sign of a lack of leadership. And it is also a sign that even though she has this great agenda, would any of it be actually implemented? The other thing I think that would be interesting to consider is that she has a really good job as a senator. Like Sanders, for example, was kind of like a whatever senator. The, the Senate gave him a platform, but Elizabeth Warren and, and she and Sanders I'm comparing because they're the two like progressivist of the candidates who have a realistic chance of winning. Um, compared to Sanders, though, she actually has done really awesome stuff in the Senate. Uh, as I said, she, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, is um, as strong as it can be uh, during the Obama years because of her advocacy. The attention that she brings to financial crime and the overall uh, fight that she's done for the middle class in the Senate is really good and it would really suck for her to not be in the Senate anymore. I just get this sense that she's moving from a position where she has a lot of the right skills and does very well in to a different role where it does not maximize on her skills and it is not a place where she would thrive. And that, that's just like one of the things that I have in my head. But either way, she wants to run for president. She's obviously thought about it quite a bit, so maybe she has a plan. The other thing is that she just can't let go of capitalism. She has this unbreakable faith that markets are good. And that is not only wrong, but it's going to lead you down some really dark paths. It's people with good intentions, but unbreakable faith in markets that has resulted in this sort of technocratic oligarchy that the Democratic Party has been pushing. That's the kind of thing that made Barack Obama uh, not as good a president as he could have been. That was the kind of thing that resulted in Bill Clinton being responsible for a lot of the things that caused the financial collapse. The big thing that Americans and the world are going to need to learn about how economics works is that capitalism is a self-defeating system that creates periods of major economic collapse. And that's not a bug, that's a feature. There's really no getting around that with the self-correcting mechanisms of markets. Economic depressions are inevitable. They have been going on ever since capitalism started and they won't ever go away until capitalism is defeated. The fact that she's a big supporter of capitalism makes me uh, very unhappy. And luckily she seems to be moving in the right direction, but if I can just see her make one movement towards being like, actually, maybe markets are bad, I would be a lot happier. The foreign policy stuff's problematic. She's still very much, just like Bernie Sanders, actually, I don't really don't like that much, um, is this idea that America still needs to be a global leader, that it still needs a strong military, and that the US still should be intervening in other countries. Uh, I don't like any of that. I think that uh, I got approximately 4 million comments asking me to get to Mike Gravel, which like would be way, way further down the line because he has almost no support and doesn't even want to be president for that matter. Uh, but the one thing that he's trying to do is push these candidates to be more left wing when it comes to foreign policy, which is a thing that these people can't seem to give up. But I think that comes from the fact that both Sanders and Warren are not really foreign policy focused candidates. And so they kind of just default to a like more liberal position of what their foreign policy goals are just just to fill it out. But uh, they have an opportunity with this kind of new left turn that's going on to say some really meaningful things about the role America plays in the world and pushing for some very fundamental change. That is all to say, like, I feel like I've been dragging her for too long. I feel like we are spoiled. And a lot of people where 2016 was their first election, 
uh, have their expectations uh, blown a little wild. The Sanders campaign and the Trump campaign opened up the Overton window a lot. And now our expectations, the fact that my nitpicks are that the Democratic candidate can't say that capitalism is bad is uh, showing that things have gone a long, long way. And that in any other election I've been following, I've been following American politics since I was a teenager. This is the fifth presidential election that I have been following. And Elizabeth Warren is light years ahead of any other presidential candidate that the Democrats have fielded in this time. So in my mind, she's still, even though there's lots of problems, she's still really good in the bigger scale for my younger audience members. And we should be a little bit more considerate of things like that when making our decisions, say if Sanders starts to tank in the polls and Elizabeth Warren's all that's left, we really shouldn't, you know, uh, cut off our nose to spite our face, we should say. Anyways, the next episode in the series is someone who I will very much not be saying those things about. Uh, yeah, next time we're gonna talk about Kamala Harris and see if America is ready for a cop American president. There is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You built a factory out there, good for you. But I want to be clear, you moved your goods to market on the roads the rest of us paid for. Yep. You hired workers the rest of us paid to educate. You uh, were safe in your factory because of police forces and fire forces that the rest of us paid for.